going to receive the presentation from the Department of Agriculture. The, uh, the presentation on how are they going to deal with the issue of land, the clear land that are in the hands of the traditional leaders. So today we, we are going to listen to the pre presentation to hear because we are from the provinces and we are from the rural area where there are a lot of traditional leaders, where the traditional leaders have the interest on this matter. So today we are going to receive that presentation uh, from the department so that when we go back to our constituency, we must uh, oversight on them to check whether uh, what they said in the meeting is, is implemented outside there. So honorable members, by say, so saying, you are welcome to this meeting, feel free. Uh, we hope uh, DG and uh, DM you will stand for us now. Uh, before I say that, uh, Aska, if I yes, to, yeah, yeah, to say something. Um, yeah. The agenda? So I say that, uh, Aska? Uh, the agenda, you to, to, to yeah, briefing yeah. by the department on the uh, government's yeah, position yeah, regarding the fate of communal land government uh, governed by traditional uh, leaders in accelerating land uh, use uh, using uh, state-owned uh, land uh, as a source uh, uh, of land for redistribution. Okay. That's the agenda. And then obviously the adoption of minutes. Yeah. Okay. Any apologies? We have two apologies, Ms. Uh, Gwenya and Ms. Mukause. Thank you very much. GM, okay. uh, I did receive a letter of uh, apology or should a GM deal with it? Should I give the GM to deal with it or should I, because uh, the minister wrote a letter to me? Thank you very much. Uh, well, you, you could deal with it, uh, Chairperson, but I'm aware that the minister is not available. Okay. I received a letter from the minister says it's in um, at the inverse. Um, yeah, there. It in, at in Eastern Cape. Yes. Having a program there of, in, of agriculture, so she could not make it to our meeting. And another apology is from the Deputy Minister Squasha. We will not be able to attend this meeting of today, but we are happy because the Deputy Minister Sumadamin is with us. Uh, without wasting any time, let me give to DM to say something before, after that he can give the to present. <coughs> Yes, Chairperson, I wouldn't uh, uh, delay the meeting uh, for the reason that the DG is going to, as he leads our delegation, is, is going to uh, present who is going to present. But I wish us all uh, to take these matters as we are taking them seriously in this space. And uh, with all respect, uh, the land question is a burning question or twitch, there should be a sign that uh, uh, we are moving. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Chairperson, so that you give our DG to introduce the presenter. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, DM. Uh, you are right, because this issue, especially the, the land that we see in the hands of the traditional leaders, it's a serious burning issue. They are questioning a lot about the land, but not only them, even the community itself, they are, uh, they are questioning a lot. And uh, as can, we were supposed to be joined by the Deputy Minister Papela. Is it the meeting? Because he was saying he's going to join us. Um, I don't see him particularly, but I see somebody from his office. Uh, Mr. Adams, I think it is Mr. Brian Adams. Okay. From his office. 
Okay. After the DG, maybe you will tell us whether the uh, DM uh, uh, will, uh, will join us so that we must do a proper uh, introduction to the meeting. Uh, DG, the platform is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I have uh, colleagues that are part of this delegation. Amongst them is uh, Miss uh, Queen Filani, who is the director in the branch that deals with the land tenure reform in the department. Uh, I've got Advocate Ngwengwe, uh, who deals with the portfolio uh, regarding uh, the administration of state land. Uh, I've got Miss Kubuza in the office of the DG. Um, I also have uh, Dr. Sfison Dombela uh, um, from the National Agricultural Marketing Council, an agency of the department that is working uh, with the department in the development of the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. And uh, as we proceed with the presentation, the members will appreciate uh, the, the role uh, Dr. Dombela is going to play in this presentation. Chairperson, I'm going to request my colleague, uh, Ralph, uh, to project the presentation if he's got the rights, or otherwise we'll request the secretariat to project the presentation. I will start with the, uh, the, the presentation, and uh, at a particular point, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Ndombela, and uh, especially when we deal with the issues of the agriculture and agro-processing master plan, specifically as they relate to the land that we are discussing. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, that is the outline of the presentation. There is a specific context to this question. Let me from the outset say to the honorable members, the question uh, that was posed by the, the the committee to the department on the fate of communal land um, in the context of land reform generally, because it impacts on all the three legs uh, of land reform. It impacts uh, on the on 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 tenure reform, uh, which is one of the critical components of the of of land reform. Tenure reform being the lack of land reform that deals with the issue of rights to land by South Africans in this context. Tenure reform will be in relation to rights of communities and individuals who reside on communal land, whom uh, as a department and in terms of the white paper on land policy in South Africa, the communities and the individuals that reside on communal land are regarded as the de facto owners. In other words, the state, the land may be registered in the name of the state, but in actual fact, the land belongs to the communities and the people uh, who, who, who live on that land. Uh, with regard to land redistribution, uh, we will speak directly to that. Um, on in terms of restitution, the constitution does not preclude a restoration of communal land if on any of the pieces of communal land in any of the 11 uh, self-governing territories and homeland, if any of that land is claimed and it is proved that the claim is valid, unless that land is encumbered and is not restorable, communal land is also subject to restitution. That's the context in which I bring restitution in the context of the three legs of land reform. The one element of land redistribution, I mean of land reform rather, that is not applicable to communal land is land redistribution. Because when you are talking about communal land, you are talking about the 
of the land uh, to which Africans during the consolidation of the apartheid state and its preceding uh, 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 governments uh, moved and allocated the 13% the, the to, to the Africans who were banished into these former homelands that were formerly called the reserves. And that land was allocated to those communities and the traditional uh, leadership institutions that govern administratively that land. And therefore, that land cannot be and is not subject to the land redistribution because it is already it already has owners. While legally the land in the deeds office uh, is registered as state land, it may be broadly categorized as state land in legal terms because by title it it is it is state land except in the case of KwaZulu Natal where it is uh, under Ingonyama Trust land. This land actually is not state land because it is occupied. It was set aside for the purposes of settlement by communities and tribes during uh, the consolidation uh, of the dispossession project uh, by apartheid and its predecessors. So this land cannot be uh, considered as part of the broad land redistribution. Land redistribution seeks to address equity in terms of land ownership in South Africa. As all of us will know the history, the majority were not allowed to own land. Uh, that is why we've got land hang hunger, we've got landlessness, we've got land tenure insecurity. So there's a whole range of categories of people who must benefit from land re redistribution, be it in rural areas outside of the former homelands, be it in the uh, small towns, the outer peripheries of our cities and towns, be it in urban areas. Land redistribution is not limited to agricultural land. Land redistribution also extends to other uses other than just agriculture. As much as the focus of the department over the last 25, 26 years has largely been to acquire land for land for agricultural development, but land reform and land redistribution specifically seeks to address landlessness, homelessness, but it also seeks to disrupt the apartheid spatial segment patterns where the majority of the landless are living in the outer periphery further and further away from the places of work. So land reform is a land redistribution is that transformative instrument through which the apartheid spatial settlement patterns can be addressed. On the issue of the, um, the, the future of what is the government plan about uh, 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 communal land uh, as, it st as things stand, the honorable members will remember that uh, the president in 2018 appointed a, an advisory panel constituted by experts. Uh, these experts were given a period of time to advise government on, a, on, on, on land and agriculture, on new policies on land and agriculture. This panel concluded its work. Uh, it submitted its report to the president the report was presented to Parliament. Subsequent to that, the president established an interministerial committee chaired by the deputy president and several ministers to consider and process the recommendations of the advisory panel. The advisory panel and the, the, the IMC rather processed the recommendations of the panel. About 60 of the recommendations of the panel were accepted by cabinet on the 13th of December, 2019. Among the recommendations of the panel that were accepted by the president, uh, by cabinet rather, in 2019 uh, December, it was a recommendation for the department to develop an overarching integrated land administration policy and legislation. 
Uh, I'm happy to report, Chairperson, that the department is at an advanced stage of developing uh, both the broad land tenure policy framework that caters for the categories of people that I have alluded to before, including specifically communal land, uh, but also to relook really at the land registration system in the country, because as you know, the land registration system and uh, the land records in the country are currently limited to the largely the former four provinces of the then South Africa pre-1994. That is your, 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 your Cape, your Natal, your Orange Free State, and your Transvaal. The areas outside of those former white uh, provinces have got a completely different la uh, land tenure regime. So the proposed framework uh, that the panel recommended to government seeks to make sure that there is a diverse policy system that must cater for different land needs. Now, that policy is currently under development. Um, we, as I said, it was accepted. We will be presenting uh, the draft policy to the Interministerial Committee of the Deputy, chaired by the Deputy President towards the end of this month, and uh, other proposals. Chairperson, you'll already be also aware that the, the, the House of Traditional Leaders nationally has also made very specific recommendations with regard to what must happen to this uh, land. The House has recommended, among other resolutions, it took at its own summit that this land must be must be transferred to traditional uh, councils. Uh, the Department of uh, Agriculture, Land Reform and World Development, the Department of COCTA, and uh, the Department of Justice, early in the year, we undertook uh, visits together with the, the House of Traditional Leaders to Botswana and uh, Uganda to study the land administration models in those countries so that as we develop this policy and legislation that will govern uh, the future of communal land in South Africa, uh, we, we, we have learned experiences from other countries that got their freedom before us. So the next plan, obviously, is that once the plan is presented to the IMC, the, 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 the position of government is presented to the IMC, uh, the IMC, through the these three main departments, is going to undertake provincial consultations with traditional leaders to discuss the proposals and the position of government, uh, through which then ultimately the process of finalizing the policy regime for communal land administration uh, or land administration broad, broadly and the subsequent uh, legislation will be developed. So that is the direction. But what we are saying, as much as uh, there are all of these policy developments that are happening, there are people, a large number of people that are living on communal land in South Africa. And there is high uh, levels of hunger, there's high levels of poverty, there's high levels of underdevelopment. So as the department develops uh, the policy on uh, the, 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 the agriculture and agro-processing master plan, the primary focus and the starting point of the department is going to be one on the land reform farms that have been acquired by the state, the plus minus nine million hectares of land acquired, and then simultaneously the development of communal land in South Africa, because the studies have shown us uh, the potential of uh, this land. What you see here on your screen is the breakdown of the total land surface of South Africa, the 122 million hectares. It includes towns, cities, industrial areas, suburbs, farmland, and, and so on. And then you will see that there is a breakdown there of the various categories of farmland. So, so that is in broad strokes what is in on slide four that is on the screen. We can move on to the next slide. Now, here, again, we, we are just simply trying to demonstrate 
chairperson. Mm -hmm. the, the, the extent of the policy, having said what is going to happen with regard to the policy formulation and what is going to be the future outlook uh, of land administration that involves communal land, government is going ahead with its plan to say we will not exclude these particular areas outside of uh, uh, in in the former homelands as part as an integral part of the development of the agriculture and agro processing agro processing master plan i'm going to at this stage chairperson invite dr swison tombella to just very quickly come in here to say what is the key thrust of the agriculture and agro processing master plan particularly as it relates to the nearly 17 million hectares of communal land in South Africa. Spiso? Yeah, um, uh, good afternoon and thanks, DG, um, for that comment. Um, the agriculture and agro-processing master plan um, is basic, it's part of the, um, it's part of the seven sector plans that has been um, identified by the presidents, which was also um, um, stated in the, in the in the SONA of 2020, where the, the, the president and the, the government have identified these sectors as the key drivers of reindustrializing industrialization of our economy and creation of jobs, but also ensuring that you are able to include more, more people into the formal economy, including those areas that have been over looked in terms of investment into our country over the past uh, two decades. And the agriculture and agroprocessing master plan in itself focuses on agriculture and agroprocessing industries. And what it, it seeks to achieve through, through is basically saying, how do you build on top of the success that have been seen by the commercial sector in agriculture? As we know that the agri sector is dualistic in nature. You have on one hand, your very large, um, uh, successful export-oriented, well-resourced commercial farmers, which, which are predominantly white. And on one hand, you have the, the number of uh, smallholder farmers um, who are resource poor, are scattered, and whom for the... Spiso, you have disappeared. Spiso? And force that is driving the reconstruction and growth of our economy. You ensure that you do not continue the exclusion of those that has been excluded in the past. And how we, we, we go about that in the agriculture and agroprocessing master plan is, is that it, it, it has five broad pillars. One of that pillar is basically around creating an investment friendly uh, and poli policy and legislative framework, which really builds up on the work that our colleagues from your land branch within the department, which are doing to try and, and, and fast track the access into land, but also the issues of water, including the revitalization of the irrigation scheme in the former homelands, which we know they've been led to deteriorate in the past, which basically continued also to contribute into this food insecurities and poverty that we've seen in our communal areas. And also the issues of around access to market, the issues around research and development, issues around um, protection of soil, soil erosion and other and, and, and adaptation to climate, but also bringing up some of the indigenous knowledge that we see sit in, in different parts of our, our country, which has not been really uh, given attention. And one of those commodities that are very key, particularly from the smallholder farmers, which we know from the commercial lenses have been overlooked, is really the commercialization of goats, in particular the provinces like was in Natal, Eastern Cape and Limpopo, but also other niche products like the cannabis and so forth. So all that part forms in, in the first pillar of saying, how do you create an inclusive and investment-friendly environment that can leverage from the existing government resources and be able to create that strong partnership with the private sector so that you also leverage into the skills and the resources that are sitting in the private sector. And, and through that, that's where also we have come up with what we call the production scheme, which I think in the next slide we'll be talking about. And another area of the, of the master plan, um, which is key, 
is then how do you create and ensure that you expand and you maintain the infrastructure in the areas, particularly around the, the communal areas. And part of that is really revitalizing these agri hubs where now we are revamping even the model and the design of it to ensure that we deal with the even the international um, donors such as the African Development Bank, which will be able to ensure that there's that investment even on the private sector. And part of that also is to drive then the issue of the market where we have enrolled in to say, how do we even build the capacity of the emerging farmers to, so that they can be at the level of their counterpart in the commercial sector and be linked into the markets, both starting with your institutional markets, but also linking with the original market and leveraging on the recently signed African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And in this slide, um, through the, through, uh, what you see now is really starting to put in step by step on the ground to say, as you create these what we call production schemes, which is really a model that will drive this massive production as well as processing, as well as the localization of food into the system so that you don't only just deal with ex with availability of food, but you also deal with access to food as well as affordability of food, which we've seen becoming a big problem during COVID-19 where the country had enough food at the country level, but most of the household, particularly those that are in the rural poor, as well as the urban poor communities, we are unable to assess or to afford food. And through this rapid release of both agricultural, state-owned agricultural land, as well as some of the land that has been seen as having high potential for agricultural production, even in the communal areas, have been identified and assessed and be linked into those production schemes, specifically into the different products, so that you are able to release that land to produce certain products, particularly those that are key for our food basket. If you're looking at the 21, uh, 28 um, uh, um, food item that form part of the typical food basket into the country. If you move maybe to the next slide, um, is then where as part of, of this, where we will then have to be able to see once you are able, once if you can just go on on the slide and see you, you see the map. Once you've been able to identify land that is available and suitable for production, both in the communal areas and across different provinces where the state has acquired that. Not of course the part of the driving the overall land reform even on the commercial land. And also now created these production schemes is to ensure that you start aligning it into farmers and expand your extension program, which also ensure that you transfer the technical knowledge and the know-how of producing across the country. And these different production scheme, what it does basically, it shows now through that mapping exercise has been done to say, not only just talking about communal areas of the state land, but being specific, if you go to the province of Oslo Natal or the province of Limpopo, and being specific to say in each district, how much land is available and what can it be produced for. And these different commodity, uh, um, commodity pro oh, sorry, production scheme is really those that has been prioritized uh, and there are 18 in total of them. And they ranges from those commodities that are very key for your production in terms of food security level, and also ensuring that you drive this inclusive and part meaningful participation of all the farmers, including those that were previously disadvantaged, but also those commodities that have a very strong linkages with your agro-processing and your, and, your, and, and your downstream industry, so that you are able to create even these um, high generation into our GDP for our country, but also those products that have high export orientation so that you'll be able to generate foreign earnings for our country to ensure that you drive this balance of payment for our country. And we believe through this agriculture and agro-processing master plan um, is that it will then be able when you put into all these building blocks ranging from the investment friendly climate, moving to the extension officers, as a relation of land, creation of the, uh, of the enabling infrastructure and the research and this training of farmers will be able to create over 317,000 jobs over and above the 600,000 jobs at the primary level. Above that, you'll also be able to create over 63,000 um, jobs at the processing level, which is your SMMEs, which we drive this input replacement of our product. Because we believe if you're looking into the 
industries uh, producing and the economy around your coastal areas. These are the land that are very fertile, but if we also take into account the change in climate as the production of some of the greens move towards the eastern northern part of our country, these are land that will become critical for our food security going forward in the next 10 to 15 years. And the identification of these priority products is based on that social climate environment for this product. And they will be able to even uplift the majority of the of the house out of poverty. And this is my last point before I hand it to DJ, is that key to the master plan itself when we talk of the inclusivity is that it's not all about just creating jobs so that people are working uh, into commercial farms, but it's to ensure they also transfer these skills so that they can be able to tend this available land and become employers and creators of the processing and economy in the rural areas in themselves so that you are able to localize this food and you are able to really uplift the rural development in the country. So in, 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 in the, the pillars that are behind the agriculture and agroprocessing system to drive this inclusive growth that we'll see as now ensuring that agriculture continues to be a dominant force that lead the recovery of our economy. And I think the next two slides really talks about the work that we've already doing in the in the red meat production scheme so that you can see it on the ground how it's changing the lives of the ordinary South Africans, particularly as well as the grains, making them into the formal market so that they don't just become informal participant into the village and going forward. DGI, you can take it. Um, I, I don't know if I should proceed on these two slides on the production scheme or you can that's, move that's fine. That's fine, Spiso. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair. <clears throat> Sorry. Basically, what we are trying to demonstrate, Honorable Chair, while the policy around the future of land administration in South Africa is being determined through that extensive consultative process with the traditional leaders and the whole of government, we have got through research identify the development potential in these particular areas. I think the slide that is on the screen is just showing what the department has been doing since 2017 uh, up to 2019, where just assisting farmers in the former homelands in KwaZulu Natal, in the Eastern Cape, in Northwest, and, 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 and I think part of uh, Northern Cape. Here, you are seeing that the majority of livestock in the in this country sits in the hands of black farmers, but they are not participating in the full value chain. So as a department, having identified this potential, we want to upscale what we call the National Red Meat Development Value Chain. We want to upscale it across the country in the former homeland where the large majority of this uh, of the of the red meat is is located to other parts of the country, including the Western Cape. Next slide, please. Here, we, we are just demonstrating uh, some of the partnerships that we are exploring with big companies such as Tiger Brands. Uh, honorable members, um, as you know that Mpumalanga has been producing up, and up about 40% of the country's grains. But with the, with the ex extensive exploration of coal and other mining activities uh, in the country, it has become apparent that we need to look at other areas where grains can be grown uh, in, in the country. The study that we conducted, it has shown a huge potential for grains in the Eastern Cape, KZN, and some other parts of the country, including particularly wheat in, in, in the Western Cape. But the areas what you are talking about in the in those nine pro, in the eight provinces except for Western Cape, a large part of these areas it is communal land. Simply just making an example, we are working with various uh, uh, businesses, uh, private sector companies who are saying to to the department, we want to have access to the land that you have uh, to assist to work with you so that your farmers can grow the products that we want for our markets, we will buy all of those uh, products. So there is a partnership, as you can see, for instance, between our department, uh, the National Agricultural Marketing Council, 
the uh, Agricultural Research Council, uh, the Land Bank, facilitating all these offtake agreements with a number of uh, uh, big companies, Tiger Brands just being one of them. There are others that are coming on stream, and uh, perhaps as soon as we finalize those agreements, we can just break it down uh, to the honorable members. But those are your grain items, uh, ranging from wheat, maize, sorghum, ground nuts, uh, soccer beans, and so on, uh, sugar be uh, so soya beans, rather, uh, going forward. As part of this project, uh, uh, honorable members, there on, 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 on soya beans, we are going to be initiating during the course of this month a very big project in Oar Tambo district, an area that is wholly owned, that is wholly communal land, where we have discovered that there's potential to grow in the uh, extent of some 20,000 hectares uh, of soya beans there. But we are saying people are not going to export, they are not going to grow the soya beans and export it to be processed elsewhere. It must be it must be grown in our tambo. It must be processed in our tambo, packaged in our tambo, and whatever surplus and uh, that they can produce, it can be exported outside of there. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, I think here again, uh, this is just the breakdown of the various uh, grains uh, uh, items showing the different parts of the country where we are planning to zoom into those particular areas to, to upscale production in those areas, particularly now that we've got uh, big uh, companies, private companies that have uh, demonstrated willingness to provide offtake agreements uh, to our farmers. So our farmers will no longer just produce and then their, 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 their products just rot in the fields because there's no storage facilities, no uh, packaging facilities, and so on. So the Agriculture and Agro-Processing Master Plan, we plan to decentralize that infrastructure into these former homelands where the potential of land of, of growing these commodities is, where there are people who are already producing uh, these commodities, but they can also process them in those particular areas. I think we can move on to the next, next slide. I think we have made the point about the potential of development of communal land. Now, the question says the future of uh, the fate of communal land as contribution to state land, as, as contribution to land redistribution. And I think I've addressed the issue that land redistribution has got no role in so far, or communal land has got no role in land redistribution because that land is already owned. We must address the inequity between the 30% and, and, and the difference. Rather, the state has identified some uh, 1.3 million hectares of, of state-owned land state-owned land, which is not necessarily communal land. This is land that was acquired to, uh, as part of the consolidation of the former homelands, but throughout the years, various successive apartheid governments have acquired land, and this land is now sitting in the balance sheet of various state, state departments. So 1.3 million hectares was identified the balance of the 1.3 is, is, is under claim. There's a restitution process that is underway. We'll talk very quickly about that. But we have identified 700,000 hectares of underutilized or vacant state land, very much uh, neighboring uh, some of the former homelands. It is this land that the president announced in the State of the Nation address that it will be allocated to women, uh, to youth, uh, to people with disabilities, and uh, military veterans. So the, the department is working on allocating this particular plan to those categories of beneficiaries. As part of the process of allocating the 700,000 hectares, uh, the department has de already developed a beneficiary uh, selection and land allocation policy this policy was approved for, for, by cabinet in December for public consultations. We've gone out on public consultations. We've received public comments. We've taken it back to the IMC. And then from IMC, we'll take it to the cabinet system, from cabinet committees up to cabinet, so that 
as we allocate the 700,000 hectares and any other land will allocate into the future. Those categories of women, 50%, youth, 40% uh, people with disability and military veterans being tar targeted uh, through that, that, that disposal process. Next slide, please. Now, one of the preconditions, uh, I think the, the, the next slide uh, just deals with more of the process. We've got to make sure that the land is advertised. We will not take it for granted that if we so see a few cattle on that particular land, that that land is encumbered. We want to determine even in the land that is encumbered, who is on that land on what basis? It could well be that in the former homelands, the old magistrates or the former uh, Bantustan governments may have given permission, or even traditional authorities themselves may have given a permission to some of these people. In those instances, we are going to regularize that. But otherwise, the land will be advertised to ensure that we reach the targets. So we'll explore all the various uh, media platforms in terms of making sure that there is a nationwide awareness, particularly for communities in the provinces where the land is, is, is located. Uh, this is what the slide is really uh, talking about. But the minister will soon be making an announcement about when is the application uh, process going to open with regard to the 700,000 uh, hectares. Next slide, please. The, the second, well, this is the critical part, part. I think this is what the president also emphasized. In the past, we have generally allocated people land without making sure that they get the requisite training. Uh, in terms of making sure that they properly use the land. As part of a precondition for allocation of land, which is in the beneficiary selection and land allocation policy, is that there will be compulsory training that is going to be provided to a range of farmers. We accept that there could be people that have been farming for decades, but those that are going to be brought on board to be allocated that land must be subjected to training that will be made available by the different institutions, particularly the agencies of the department that are listed, such as the ARC, the OPP, NAMEC, and also using agricultural colleges uh, in tra training them in those various areas, uh, such as uh, production, giving them technical skills, business, entrepreneurial, marketing, and so on, but also managing uh, the, 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 the safety, uh, the, the, the health, animal health, because as you know, some parts of our country are prone to certain animal diseases such as foot and mouth. So for them to really participate in, the, in this particular economy, they've got to be trained in, in these particular areas. Next slide, please. Here we're just basically setting out the type of training that I've quickly run through and uh, which will be customized, obviously, depending on the level of experience and the knowledge of those who apply and become successful, then the training will be tailor-made to meet the needs of those farmers. The next slide just basically gives you what we have done to date as part of that 700,000 hectares. Uh, those are the provinces where already 135,000 hectares has been allocated. That gives you the breakdown. Those are the women, 160, that have benefited youth, uh, 114 and, and one person with disability. The rest, the next slide, deals with the rest of the breakdown of the hectares in terms of where they are. As you will see, the biggest number of the hectares uh, for good reason, for obvious reasons, uh, that is going to be Northwest, where there's going to be a large number of uh, those hectares. You will see uh, that uh, in the Eastern Cape, there's a part of that land largely because some of it has people have moved on it on it and occupied it free state there isn't a large part of state land that is vacant there, there those are the numbers then you'll have uh, kwazulu natal and uh, pumalanga and then uh, and, and and some part in the in, in 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 northern cape the next one the next slide really deals with the land that i spoke about as part of this 1.3 we have found that uh, approximately 360,000 hectares of the state land is actually underclaimed. 
and uh, it, and and the next slide will deal with the different uh, categories uh, of the claims because as you will see that from the analysis that has been done by the commission uh, some of these uh, claims about 44000 hectares of this land we are saying is under claim these are new order claims in other words these are the claims that were uh, lodged uh, at the at uh, when when the claims were reopened in 2014 so the courts have said don't process those claims, deal with the old order claims. Then again, we then further categorize and break down the rest of the land, how many hectares amounting to how many properties and, and how far is the commission uh, uh, gone with regard to the processing and resolution of those claims uh, of, of the, of the 360,000 hectares. The next slide, please. Then the next slide will show the timeline uh, that the commission has set for itself uh, to conclude its processes because this, uh, uh, the commission has got to follow the law in terms of uh, researching the claim, verifying the claim, the, the, the claimants, and all of those processes. And these are the targets by which the commission uh, hopes to have concluded uh, research uh, on, 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 on all of the hectares that uh, on, on at least 117,000 hectares of the state land. This is the state land that is not going to be part of redistribution, but it's going to be uh, at redressing the imbalances of the past because there were people who were removed from that state land. In fact, the fact that this land today is owned by the state, the previous owners of this land were removed by previous government. So restitution is giving back to the rightful owners, their land. That is the last slide, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, before I give to members, uh, let me check with uh, Deputy Minister. Do we have uh, anything to add? Or you are fine? DM, are you fine? I can give back to the members to ask questions. I'm fine, uh, uh, Chairperson. You can give it back to members for questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, now it's your time for asking questions. Oh, yes, I'll start with um, Honorable Smith. Can I start, Honorable Chair? Honorable Clute. Honorable Laboskahni, Honorable Itumeleng Tube, and Honorable Honorable Machibe, Honorable Arnold, and Lute, yes, you can continue. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, Honourable Chair, um, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say because um, this presentation, uh, you know, touch uh, very softly on what we've actually requested as a committee. And then it resembles a lot the, the district type of model or the uh, agri-parks model type of approach. <laughs> That, that doesn't really address um, the question about, uh, you know, uh, the future of, of land within tribal areas. Now, I am concerned, firstly, um, that the department says that uh, the, the com land that's in communal areas or old um, uh, 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 um, um, you know, uh, uh, traditional areas or whatever, is not uh, subject to restitution uh, because it's already in the uh, hands of um, the owners. Now, he contradicts himself uh, by also saying that um, the land uh, legally is, in, uh, uh, is registered in the name of the state. Um, and... Um, that it is not registered in the name of the community. So that's the that is that's a redistribution process. So I I want to refer firstly to our constitution. 
If we go to chapter two, Bill of Rights, section 25, uh, subsection five and six, it reads as follows. The state must, not can or should, but oh must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land on an equitable basis. Subsection six continues. A person or community whose tenure of land is legally insecure, legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices is entitled to the extent provided by an act of parliament, okay, either to tenure which, uh, uh, which is legally secure or comparable redress. Right. So with that said, um, is this land within communal areas at all legally secure? Does the communities, because it's said that the communities who stay on the land is the owners of the land. Okay, but in the same breath, um, we're talking about tribal authorities. Now, tribal authorities represents customary law, customs, culture, you know, language, all those type of things that they represent, okay? Uh, which they've got roles and responsibilities, again, mentioned in the, in the constitution not rights and privileges, but roles and responsibilities. So, um, if, if this land is then managed by tribal authorities on behalf of the communities, then I'm asking myself the following question. These tribal authorities, are they, and authority is, is another, uh, that, another question because it's tribal leadership. Because authority, we've got one authority and the authority is government, which is an elected body. And that's why I'm coming back to this. Tribal leaders are not elected by communities, but is carried by bloodline. Okay, so, the department says that the, is, it consulted one of the one of the stakeholders here, okay, which is the tribal authorities or tribal leaders, which by assumption represents all the community, but they are not elected by that community. Um, and then my question would be, where is the consultation with the community itself? Because I know for a fact I've been at some seminars that's been arranged by, by a, a government itself where tribal authorities and other stakeholders, CPAs and all of that came together. And I know for a fact that there's some communities who are not satisfied with that system. And there's a conflict between the CPAs and the tribal authorities. So, if you say that the land is secure in their hands, then I'm asking if, if a person is a pedi, for example, a year in Limpopo in Mokopani where I'm coming from, or, or in the Bele for that matter, and they, they don't stay here because you said that people who stay on the land, they are now staying in the cities, or they're staying in Cape Town, or they're staying in KwaZulu Natal. Uh, do they have any legal um, security to show that this land belongs to them, that they've got ownership? And what is the percentage of ownership? Because if, a, if the land is owned by a community, then it should be in a communal trust, and each community member must have a share certificate, or a family for that matter. So, that is something that must be addressed. And that is part of the responsibility of government in terms of the constitution that we cannot deny. The second question that I have is when we look at these 
tribal areas because a lot of attention was given to farm to smallholder farmers and the you know and farm uh, farmland and you know all of that but i'm talking here about residential stands business properties within these communal communal areas that has been built up by these communities by individuals not not in a group but individuals built a house so do they own that land no, they don't. The second, the follow-up question on that is, with all the corruption in our country, with money that's being uh, 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 taken from government, you know, we see uh, big mansions popping up within tribal areas. And I move a lot around tribal areas. And obviously, there's no title to that land. So if government one day have to recover money, that is the perfect place to go and hide all that money that has been taken out of, uh, out of uh, government coffers. Because you cannot recover that. Because the land belongs to government, is managed by a tribal authority or CPA, and the pe people who stay on it has got only user right on it which is determined, which is insecure in the first place, but government want to give lip service by giving those people only, uh, a, 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 you know, more secure user rights. When we talk about this 700,000 um, uh, um, hectares of government land that will be redistributed, it is totally, it's, it's it, disingenuous for that matter, because in, the National Council of Provinces, a specific question was asked whether this, on this, where the response was that this land will not be given to those individuals, the women, the youth, the uh, 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 military veterans and so forth. They will get leases, 30 year or whatever leases. So it will still remain within government hands. So can the department confirm whether what I'm saying now is in fact true or not? And if you say it's not true, then please prove the, the opposite. Thank you, Jay. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, before I give to Honorable Plute, let's uh, note the apology for Deputy Minister uh, Honorable Babela. He, he loved to be with us, but unfortunately he's joining another meeting where he deployed by the president. Now, uh, Honorable Tute. Honorable Tute. Mr. Chairperson, um, yeah, I, I, I've got a, a, quite a few questions, so if you indulge me, I'm, I'm, I'm between devices uh, and through all the, the, the notes I made. Uh, I also want to share the concern by Honorable Bayer's uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but, but but it feels like we're already moving to getting rid of Article 25 of the Constitution, because it is it is strange to say. Whilst communal land is incidentally either registered in the name of the state or is considered to be unregistered state land, it is actually not state land. It doesn't make sense. So we need we need to 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 make sure what. What is being said there? Um, another question on the whole issue of, of communal land governed by uh, the, the, uh, traditional authorities. We see um, a lot of projects that, that will be uh, implemented there. But it should also be considered um, that you know, the cost of implementing the newly developed national policy on extension and advisory services was found to be far higher than the current budget allocation. My question regarding all this revitalization of irrigation and infrastructure, where will the money come from? Are we going to see a bigger budget for this? So that's the, the, the second question. Um, on the slide, I think it's slide six, it speaks about adopted change theory. I would like to know what that adopted change theory is. And on that note, um, 
Now we're speaking about mass production. If we're speaking about mass production, it's actually just another way of saying we, we are now moving into the territory of commercial farming. Again, back to the question, are we going to, to give, to have a budget to be able to, to, to drive commercial farming within these uh, traditional authorities. And then a last question um, regarding, uh, I've got a few questions more actually. Uh, the state land act, uh, allocation, um, I just want to know with the, with the skills assessment process. So the, there will be training done, there's a skills assessment, but I would like to know what happens afterwards. Will there be a kind of a performance management system uh, where, where women and youth and people with disabilities are assessed afterwards and, and whether those land, uh, or that land is being utilized correctly? And the, the question is, needs to be begged whether the department or, or, or the government is actually then considering that if an assessment as that is not successful. In other words, let's say a, 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 a person with disability is not successful on the farm for what reasons, whatever. Will the department be ready to, to, to take that land away from that person? And give it to someone else who can can do it. And I'm not saying it will happen, but I'm asking if it's if it if if it's ready to do that. And then the final question, and I, I asked this question recently in, in, in a debate. Um, there's a, a study recently by the Institute for Poverty Land and Agrarian Studies, uh, and it warns that. Land reform has become the preserve of the well-off, with 44% of beneficiaries being urban-based. Business individuals, taxers, uh, transport operators, former state bureaucrats, and even local politicians. I don't want to go into the politics of it. But according to the, the, the study, only 18% of the 66 farms that the Institute studied were allocated to farm workers, many of whom in, uh, encountered huge obstacles to success and have left their unsuccessful farms to seek unemployment elsewhere. Gathered, uh, yeah, data gathered on 66 land reform projects across the country found that land reform has shifted from both being pro-poor to being pro-elite. Now this is a, a political issue we need to, to uh, attend to as well. My question is, now remember, also according to the study, one out of 10 small or, or let's call it communal farmers actually uh, produce a surplus of food. One out of 10. My question is, what's the, the department doing to ensure, uh, ensure food security after land is reformed or restituted? And what measures will the department implement, as, implement especially with this plan uh, to ensure that land is not captured by either individuals, bureaucrats, politicians, how will they tend to that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Arnold. Honorable Arnold. Well, thank you, Chairperson. Yeah, uh, thank you. Let me first thank oh, sorry, the sorry, 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 Honorable oh. Arnold. Oh. It's honorable Labuskafni and it will be you. Sorry yeah, for that. <laughs> honorable Kathy. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Chair, uh, a few of these questions has been asked by the other members. I want to know uh, the critical, the, the um, communal land uh, has been seen critical for food, but uh, um, for food security, but needs infrastructure led production investment led by government to, to, to realize the potential. I would like to know what is this led by government mean? Is led by government mean that is the investment from government side? Is it funding? Is it uh, coordinating? What 
what does it really mean? And why must governments lead that? Um, and is, is there a budget for that? Then um, the, 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 the communal land and state acquired land, uh, as, uh, as we've seen for growth in agriculture and, and agri-processing as part of the master plan. How does it does this fit in in these in this communal land? I'm not I'm not talking about the state acquired land. I'm referring referring to the communal land. How many of these uh, of these uh, agri hubs and former producer units and so many of these things are close to and within the proximity of communal land to give that support or is will that be extended to these communal lands or how is this going to realize? Then uh, I would like to know, yeah, we, uh, uh, we had a very interesting and very informative session uh, at the end of last term uh, or um, on the beginning of this term, I can't remember, uh, on from all the provinces on this whole thing of the agri hubs and the former producer support units and all those things. And the picture that was painted in, in that presentation was, it's actually not going very well with all these um, uh, uh, support systems. Uh, and very few of them are functional. So how, what is going to happen within the, from the department side to make all these things Functional. Uh, I don't think by moving and shifting them to the to the Development Bank of Africa, uh, it will change uh, a lot of things there. So I would like to know what is the plan there. Then I would also like to know what is the time frame for the policy and legislation on 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 um, communal and and um, uh, state acquired land, and also actually the whole time frame on the whole land redistribution and uh, what well, that has been uh, mentioned there. Then I'm to, referring to the CPOs, other uh, members also refer to that. We know, and it's been said by the department in various um, uh, um, presentations that the, there's a very poor support for CPOs uh, legislation has been passed on that, and as far as I know, there's not a lot of improvement. So I also think um, the department must give us some more information on that, but chairperson should, should really look into this uh, on a more focused way. Then I would like to know, after 122 million hectares of land that's in, in our country. And you and there was a map of, although it you know, has given all the various kind of productions and things, what, how, may, how may, many hectares of this land has been earmarked in this master plan for, uh, for redistribution and, and production uh, for agriculture? And how many, how, how much of that for normal uh, urban, or, or not only uh, urban, but for housing, but because it was stated redistribution is not only for agriculture and production, it's also for housing and in, anything else. Um, and then um, I think I'll stop there first. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Lavoskatni. Now it's uh, Honorable Arnold, followed by Honorable Mutsube. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you also for the department for uh, the presentation. Uh, Chairperson, just to kick off, uh, in terms of the allocation now, state land allocation for 2021, 20, uh, I just want to know um, why is the Western Cape not there uh, in terms of the allocation of state land? It's just a question that, that I want to, to ask in terms of that. But, uh, let me say uh, there is an urgent need for um, 
to address landlessness and, and, and homelessness. And, and we know the pace uh, and the cost of, of, of land reform is one of the, the major challenges uh, currently the, the, uh, uh, of the current government. But let me also uh, say that the rights of people living in communal areas must, must be guaranteed. Uh, and, and we must make sure that the traditional leaders in terms of their rights and, and, and role uh, in allocation and, 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 and redistribution and also the participation of those uh, traditional leaders uh, um, is very important. Uh, and I think the provincial uh, consultations uh, will make it more uh, relevant in terms of those um, um, uh, consultations and participation. Um, the one thing that I want to, to, to find out now, and we know that there is a current struggle uh, in terms of the current small farmers. Now, if you also, uh, and I think it's a, it's a good thing uh, when you also want those communal areas also to, to uh, develop, but now in terms of resources and everything, we know uh, that most of those communal areas uh, they are underutilized, uh, and there is potential for them to uh, to develop. But just in terms of the resources, uh, uh, I think we need also to to get into into that now. Um, yeah. Then um, there is another um, point that I have. Um, I think, as a person, uh, we need to more interaction with the department in terms of this uh, specific uh, area that was highlighted now today. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the policy, uh, the financial aspects and, and everything that includes now uh, this process, taking this process uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Arnold. Honorable Ntube. Honorable Ntube. Honorable Itumele Ntube. Okay. Uh, let's pass. Honorable Nana. Honorable Nana. Are you struggling again? Oh. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, now I can hear you. But you are driving. That's why you are struggling with the network. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Honorable Nana. Honorable Nana. I, Honorable Smith, because you are running it up. Honorable Smith. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's just um, a, a question that I wanted to, to uh, put out that I passed on the on my first round. Um, I want to know um, whether um, it is part of government's uh, plan or the department's plan um, to um, uh, transfer the title of that communal uh, land over to, to communities. Um, if not, why not? And then I would also like to know uh, how much uh, of communal land uh, 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 um, that's beyond the, the land that's now in the Kunyama Trust have been transferred uh, to individuals or communities in communal areas. Uh, since uh, the start of democracy in 1994. Thank you. Okay, honorable. Are you back, honorable Nana? Uh, it seems he's not. Jefferson. Honorable Nana? He's in the meeting, but I don't know. Jefferson, on Twitter, I also have another question. Yes, I see. Let me give the people who didn't speak before, and then I'll come back to you. I've seen your hand. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? 
I've tried to yes, I can hear you. Yeah, please, Peg. Yeah, you can ask a question, Honorable Nana. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chairperson, uh, I, I have two issues to raise. Yes. The first one, the first one relates to to crop farmers in in Mount Fletcher and Matatiel area. Those those crop farmers largely they. produce maize and they have an export market for, for their maize. I would like to check to what extent is the department involved uh, in, 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 that, in, that, in that operation? If the department is involved, what, what kind of support have those farmers received up to date, and what are the future plans of the department in relation to to that operation? And and the second question might be a bit irrelevant, but I want to ask it in any event, Chair. Uh, I do not know how prevalent this practice is in other provinces. But in the Eastern Cape, uh, rural areas, particularly around uh, Bishaw, King Williamstown, and also in your old Transkei along the N2, people have been in moving into either thing and plowing fields into plowing fields and they and they are building houses. Has the department taken note of this practice? Uh, has the department engaged uh, traditional authorities concerned? And 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 and, 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 and what, what do they get from from whoever they have spoken to? Uh, because as you will imagine, Chairperson, this, I mean, this is fertile, fertile land, which really shouldn't be used for, for house, I mean, for, for, for human settlement. I'm not saying people shouldn't build houses. They should build houses. But my worry is we're using Arab land for human settlement. And, and, and I'm sure we don't have much of Arab land, particularly in rural areas. Uh, that is readily available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nana. Uh, let me go back to Honorable Flute. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a quick question. Um, there was a, a booklet published by the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform uh, as part of a land audit booklet, actually that indicated, and, it, and the study particularly, uh, or the investigation was re regarding private land ownership versus state land ownership. Uh, and according to the study, uh, and maybe Honorable Nana will find this interesting, um, as much as 4 million hectares of land was unaccounted for in, um, in the Eastern Cape. That's half of the country's unaccounted extent. My question is, is the department aware of this unaccounted uh, land? And does this then uh, form part of, the, of the, the, the land that you mentioned earlier, which is actually part of the communal land? So is this communal land unaccounted, or is this just unaccounted land? We don't know where it is, who it belongs to, What's going on there? Okay, thank you very much. Honorable Matibe. Honorable Matibe. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And uh, um, we really want to appreciate the presentation by, by the department. Uh, I've got 
just a few inputs, um, uh, which includes questions, uh, of course. The, the, the first one is in relation to the policy that the, 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 the department said they're still working on, which they have consulted um, thoroughly and uh, did a study on in Utrana and the other African countries. How long, just to say, how long can that uh, take to, to finalize the policy? Because I think it's quite important that uh, the, the area of uh, communal land um, is, is directed in terms of policy and its policy finalization. Part of, of that, they said they will do provincial consultation with traditional leaders. Will it be traditional leaders only, not inclusive of the communities uh, in the traditional uh, leadership? Because traditional councils, by their own nature, they are composed of the world traditional leaders as well as the community. Because I think that part of the leg of consultation, if it is not uh, taken care of, it might uh, create some, some challenges uh, moving forward. We, we, we appreciate the, the issue of trying to create infrastructure in rural areas to assist uh, subsistence farming, just to elevate them to a level where uh, they are able to sell the products that they are uh, producing. I, I, I just want to check in terms of red meat, as they put it, that they want to upscale the red meat to, to a level where the value chain also includes uh, uh, areas in, in, in communal land. What kind of support are they giving? Because it's one area, if given support, it might uh, assist farmers uh, who are still small scale farmers in, 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 in communal land to be able to, 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 to be assisted. The, the other one which I think uh, will require that as a committee we constantly have engagements with the department is the distribution of this uh, vacant state land. Uh, it will require that we, we get briefings, uh, uh, Chairperson, in terms of the progress because there is serious a uh, hunger for, for land uh, in, 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 our, in our country. And uh, if this distribution, we uh, do look into it and uh, uh, check the progress in relation to, to it, more especially on a quarterly basis, just to check what is the progress. In Limpopo, they are going to distribute it 121,000 uh, plus hectares. So, so we would need uh, indeed to be uh, able to look into uh, the progress in relation to that uh, distribution. But uh, those are my few remarks uh, that I would want to do. It's quite important because uh, communal land is 13% um, uh, of, of the land, and uh, we still got more than 70% of the land that uh, requires distribution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chips. Thank you very much, Honorable Mativa. I've seen uh, Honorable Smith, your hand is still up. Do you still want to ask question? Honorable Smith? Honorable Smith, uh, your head my is apologies, up. Uh, Chair. No, um, I think it wasn't uh, put down. Sorry, my apology. I'm just going to put it down now. Okay. No, thanks. Um, any member who would like to ask a question before I give the back to the department? Hey, person, there is uh, one other um, question that I want to, that I left out. Uh, can, can the department also just give us a a brief response in terms of access to water. Uh, because this is now 
we know what the current state is in terms of excess to water for some of the small farmers that are struggling now, but for this specific one, how are they going to deal with, with, with excess to water and assistance to those um, communal areas? Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Arnold. Uh, before I give back to the department to answer DM, I have a uh, concern. Uh, your plan, it looks like it seems to be a very, very expensive. Because why I'm saying the, that, uh, Honorable DM, uh, you are talking about the communal commun 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 land. That is no infrastructure. That is no. Uh, uh, let's talk. Let's say undeveloped. It's not developed. It's undeveloped. So it's going to be too expensive for most of communal land. They don't have infrastructure to take a communal land to functional commercial farmer. Is very very expensive. I don't know where department will going to take that money. Maybe they have a plan of, about that. And my uh, another concern, uh, Honorable GM, I've seen in your presentation, you have uh, in the presentation, the department listed the, the land bank as a develop, development partner. <laughs> DM, now uh, land bank, it has a serious problem, financial problem. So how are they going to help, whereas they have a serious, uh, uh, they are in a crisis of finance. So I have a problem on that. This is my serious concern. And then the entire plan seems hinging to the, the old agri parks and the agri hubs and the farmer production support unit forming the con cornerstone. As we know that these uh, agri parks, the committee previously, DG, you remember <clears throat> even last time, recently fella asked you the presentation the pre uh, so that we can monitor uh, what is happening in the agri parks. But if we are talking about the agri parks, I'm seeing something that uh, is going to make the department fail because for most of the agri parks that we have, do the oversight on them. They're not functioning. So if you are taking this plan to the agri parks or to talking, including them, it's going to be a problem, uh, DM. And then my problem, the concern, concern, concern is about the finance. Are you still going to using the 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 the, the budget for the 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 grant, such as CASP, and how much uh, grant funding will be spent uh, to go to, uh, in this uh, pro uh, project? How much for until it functions? Because if we are saying it's only for this current budget, that budget is not going to be enough for that. So I, I just want to understand how much it's going to take you there. Those are my serious concerns, uh, DM. Maybe you must consider it. And lastly, uh, DM and the DG, when you talk about the communal land, please be, uh, uh, be, be very, very careful because the there are, there are a lot of, when you say you are going to give to the community, please don't create something like uh, you did, uh, the department did previously, the issue of a CPA. Now, it's a CPA, vice versa, traditional leaders, and there's no any development because they are fighting there. So make, come with a, 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 a strategy that when you give to the community, you must be having a strategy and you must make sure that that strategy it must work. And you must make sure that these women, youth, people living with a disability, there must be part and parcel of that, of that land. And then 
again, I'm, I'm still saying that land that is in the hand of the traditional leaders, I'm afraid they DM because you are talking about the land that is there. Some of the land that is in the traditional leaders, the department is already allocated to people that are not living in into the in the in the very same community. What is going to happen? When you do that, you must be careful so that it must be uh, it must be a smooth uh, a, a, a plan or a smooth. Uh, must not uh, 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 at the end of the day, uh, gov uh, traditional leaders fight with the government because of these things. Because already some the land, especially in let's say in my province, the land the, the land that are owned by government that are in the uh, 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 jurisdiction of the traditional leaders, the government has already allocated, and this is the from time to time. When the traditional leaders are in their meeting, they are discussing about that. So let's let's be careful about them. And again, let um, before we do this, there are the land that were claimed by the traditional leaders. But even if you give them authority, but you didn't give them a title deed or whatever uh, that is happening there. So please make sure that uh, when you do that, give the land that was claimed before. I can give you an example, like one uh, land that was claimed in the province that I come from, Northwest. The traditional leaders for Batarabaka Masibi in Moshawan. That land, the, 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 the traditional leaders claimed that land, the government says the land is yours, but there's nothing in black and white. So that is why the community, the, those people that are staying, they stay, they took that land on their own land. So make sure that you check all these uh, nitty gritties before you allocate people to that. Thank you very much. Uh, but your presentation, it seems if if uh, you can implement that uh, presentation, like you say, in a, you put in a presentation, it will help a lot of uh, community in our pro uh, country. That's true, uh, Chairperson. But uh, I'll, I'll allow the DG and the team to give responses to a number of uh, points that have been raised. You've cut off. It will. Thank you. Thank you. Did you? Did you? Thank you, Chairperson. You, you got cut Can off. Can you hear uh, me? Oh. Yes, Chair. Sorry. You got cut off to us. But I'm not end. driving. <laughs> I'm not driving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, honorable Chairperson, uh, honorable members, thank you for the questions and uh, the enriching comments, but also thank you for the the concerns that have been raised by the honorable members with regard to the presentation being thin on what is going to happen about communal land. Chairperson, we do not want to come here and give you uh, two slides to say, we are going to consult nationwide. Uh, the process is going to go to the provinces, national, to cabinet before the policy is approved. Thank you. So I, I we thought that we should give the committee a holistic view generally about the position of government uh, with regard to co uh, communal land. Um, the, the, the land that is communal land, we are talking about the 13%. The 13% 13 since 1994 and since the adoption of the white uh, paper on land policy in South Africa in 1977. Communal land has never been part of land redistribution. It is the 13%. We, 
which is why the land redistribution at the very outset set out a target of distributing at least 30% of white-owned agricultural land. It never included uh, communal land as part of land redistribution. And, and that's all that we are merely emphasizing, and everything else is very much in line with the Constitution, because we cannot reallocate that which is already occupied, already overcrowded, underdeveloped, and, and, and lacks uh, the requisite infrastructure. Certainly, the communities living on communal land do not have full title, as we said, the land is registered in the name of the state, but they do have rights in land. The policy that we are talking about that has been recommended for development by the presidential panel seeks to then say, you've got 800 or traditional councils in South Africa spanning the different former homelands and self-governing territories. Within this self, uh, within these 800 plus traditional councils, there are so many communities and villages. But within those communities and villages, there are households, there are individuals, there are widows, there are widowers, there are women-headed households. What is going to happen to the individual rights of people living on that land if government is saying the people who live on that land are the de facto owners of the land? What is going to be the form, the legal form, or the content of the rights that are going to be given to communities, to individuals, or groups of people? They, because they is a variety of options available. I don't think government is going to decide on a single uh, instrument. There must be a suite of options available to people to exercise. There are options, whether it's a, a share certificate, as it has been suggested, whether it's full title, but we, we want to shy away from full title. Because if we were to take full title as set out in the current Deeds Registries Act of 1937, not only will the process take 100 years, it will be way too expensive for government to do. Because if it means that we must then get professional land surveyors, survey each and every village and every homestead, register frame diagrams with the Surveyor General, appoint conveyances to register every title. It will take forever, and people will not never actually own this land. But the state won't even afford it. We have seen elsewhere around the world, both in Africa, in Asia, there are different models of registering rights, giving people full legal rights of ownership without the current system, a very, very expensive system that we currently have as a country. So, but those rights does not mean that they don't have the legal substance, that they can be tradable, that they can be transferable, that can they can be bonded by a bank. Because they will give those individuals, those families, those households and communities full rights. This is precisely what we want to consult about. We, when I said the, we went to on study tours with traditional, the House of Traditional Leaders, traditional leaders are very clear about their position. They want the, tra the land transferred to traditional leaders. Government has got to take into account all the views of all sections of society. Government can't just take the view of traditional leaders alone. It must take into account the views of communities living on this land. It must take into account the views of a number of other people in this particular area. 
it must take into account the views of civil society uh, and other organs of state and look at the practicality of what it proposes and its affordability. I like the, 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 the warning that the chair has given us to say, whatever ultimate model you come up with, it cannot be and must not be a model which will set up communities against traditional leaders, one community against another. And therefore, the, unlike with the current CPAs, a new policy will have to be very clear in terms of how such conflicts get mediated, how those disputes get resolved in a manner that is not going to require us to go to court as is the case with the CPAs and trust. So, so, so it is all those policy issues that we must consult on and then cabinet ultimately, ultimately must then say, this is going to be the policy having consulted. I'm afraid, uh, honorable members uh, and chairperson, I can't be able, I can't put my head on the block and say it's going to take three months or six months. If we had our way as a department, we could easily be back, uh, we can go to cabinet by June next year, having consulted with the bill and everything. But this is subject to many other players. But if we had our way, we'll have a policy that is completed, we'll have a bill, that we can present to the country through cabinet, and then it, it follows the normal uh, legislative process, introduction to parliament and so on and so on. But this is something that is subject to consultation with a wide variety of stakeholders. So, so, so th that is the process. I, I, the, the issue of traditional councils, what they are and what they are not, perhaps, I heard there's a colleague from COCTA. I think COCTA is best placed to respond to the question. But as far as I know, there is a traditional uh, leadership framework act. There is a traditional courts uh, framework legislation that governs the roles and responsibilities of those institutions. From our side, we know that in terms of the law, traditional councils are legal uh, our public entities. So by just simply transferring to them, we will not have transferred the rights to the people, to the communities and individuals. But those are issues that are subject to consultations with the traditional leaders. There is no intention for the state to be a perpetual owner of the land. As a matter of fact, as we speak, honorable members, we know that since 2019 and since 2009, 2010. The state has only acquired land for land redistribution purposes, and all of that land is owned by the state, and the land is leased to communities. What we are busy finalizing at the present moment, and, 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 and in due time, the minister will, will make that announcement, is allowing people to be assisted by the state through the land redistribution program, to have full title to the land. So, so land reform is not just about the state owning the land. I think land ownership, I mean, at the leasehold will be there as just part one of the mechanisms. But definitely for labor tenants, we are transferring full title. For farm dwellers, we are transferring full title. We are finalizing new grant instruments that can also be blended with the loan finance where farmers who want to acquire land in their own name, not in the aim of the state, can be allowed to apply and have full title to the land. So, so we are finalizing that. So even with this land, the 700,000 hectares, as it is as we speak, the state and lease and disposal policy do allow people to exercise an option to buy even the 2.2 million hectares we've acquired since 2006 to date through the land redistribution process, the proactive land acquisition strategy, the policy allows for people to exercise an option to buy that land. So those options are there. Perhaps we need to be quite aggressive in communicating to the people these options, allowing them 
to exercise it, but nothing present, prevents them from exercising, uh, prevents them from exercising that land, I mean, that, that right uh, to, to, to get the land to be transferred in their name. We have seen the study done by, uh, sorry, the, the lease agreement indeed will have, as it is now, the current lease policy does provide for people to be removed from the land. There will be certain conditions. If we give you, as part of these uh, uh, 800 farms uh, of state land, we are giving you this land. Uh, now, if you are then going to sublease this land to make easy money, then, then we are going to remove you. So, so the lease is a contractual agreement between the lease and the state. So, so you will have to comply with those conditions. But the, the state is not going to, for frivolous reasons, as it might happen in some instances now, just simply remove you for, for reasons that have got nothing to do with you or beyond your control. So those, there will be those kind of contractual arrangements. The farmers that are going to be given this land, the 700 hectares, are going to be given a startup support. That's a commitment we have, we, have, we have made. That there will be a startup as with regard to animal farmers, uh, stock livestock farmers, let me put it that way. We will be giving them startup support, not just the training, but we'll be giving them uh, the animal, uh, the animal uh, vaccines, we will make all of those accessible to them. But we are going to train thousands of young people to play a role of, a, call them para-animal health officials in the former homelands, because that animal, that keeping system has largely collapsed in many areas. And we are, we are very thin on veterinary services in those particular areas. We're also very thin on extension support services. But we've got a number of unemployed young, uh, young graduates. We've got a number of unemployed youth, which whom through our, our entities as a department, we want to train so that they can inoculate a, a, a cow, a sheep, or a goat. They can see all the signs. They reduce mortality rate. So, 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 so all of those things, we have got these state entities. In fact, we, we, as we speak, we are negotiating, signing contractual arrangements with the state entities to say, among your, your, uh, the things you do in terms of your legislation, these are your obligations towards the department. And the department through the funds allocated to it will make those resources to the entities like the Agricultural Marketing Council, like uh, yeah, the ARC, the OPP, to be able to bring these services closer to those communities. And indeed, we will decentralize them. If you look at the production schemes, it is true that they are very much aligned to your district development model. We do believe that the district um, development model is the future. If all of us as various government departments can coalesce around a plan at the district level as all three spheres. We believe that we can have maximum impact by crowding in our public resources as different departments in that particular space and we'll see much more bigger impact than each and every one of us as separate department working in different parts. We do believe that the district development model will also go a long way towards assisting us to mobilize the resources that are required for some of this infrastructure. For instance, our own department has mapped all the 44 districts in the country, including the eight metros. We are working very closely with the Department of, uh, of Cooperative Governance that is driving the district development model. So as we decentralize the production schemes, not the agri parks, the production schemes, as we decentralize them, bringing services to the people, we at a national level are already in discussions with the department such as your water affairs, 
who have a master plan. We, we now, as we sit here, we know what are the plans of the department for the next 25 years. But they also are telling us that there is water in water distribution or water allocation in equity in the agricultural sector. They say the agricultural sector uses about 65% of the country's water. But about 99%, 95% of that water is used by commercial farmers. That is why you then need very radical and serious water reform so that these farmers that we are talking about can have access to those water resources. We cannot have 65% of the country's water only being used by 95% of the country's water being used by just about 30,000 uh, commercial farmers. And not even the 30,000, not all of them have got all of the water rights. The number is even probably fewer. So this is one of the things that we that that this plan seeks to address. Um, the the so 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 we are discussing with our individual sister departments, such as water. But we are also discussing with departments that are buying food as part of their functions, such as the Department of Defense. There is a discussion and agreement, for instance, between the, the Department of Defense that buys food for the soldiers. We've got military bases all over the country. Where does the defense buy food for the soldiers? Be it fruits, be it meat, be it grains, and so on. So those are potential customers for our farmers. We are discussing with correctional services to buy food, meat, and all of those other items from our farmers. We have never done that before, but these are the things we want to do. We we, dis, we have similar we'll have similar discussions with social development, with health, and so on, so that part of the public money, other than social grants that go to these areas, some of the public spend procuring some of these services can go to these communities to improve income and have more money circulating in those economy in those local economies. We don't believe that the department on its own can fund the, this whole plan. But we do believe that the department, if it can rationalize its programs, not to have too many programs scattered all over the, flow, the place, which results in very, very limited impact on the ground. If we can consolidate all our programs as we are doing now around the agriculture and agro-processing master plan, we can achieve double, not possibly quadruple, the size of impact we are achieving with our budget. If we, if we downscale, streamline, focus our programs. But of course, we have got partner or sister departments, as I've mentioned. We also have the private sector that is coming to the party. I mentioned uh, Tiger, uh, Tiger, Tiger Brands. There are many others that are coming to the party. Your pick and pay, even your Woolworths, your Clover Dairies, and all of those other companies are coming to, to provide not only input. Commercial banks are saying to us, government, we are willing to partner with you. We will match you rent for rent. If you government put a bill on rent a year, we as commercial banks, banks will put a billion rand a year for the next 15 years to speed up land reform, to support farmers. So, so this is not just about the department alone. It is a social compact of government, private sector, organized agriculture, civil society, commodity organization, farmers organizations, and communities. So, so it is a broad social compact. We, we, we are very confident that uh, with energy and focus, this plan can work. So, so, so yes, we've taken the issue of, of, of the funding into account. Now, the, the, the issue of the mushrooming of, uh, call it very top-notch housing development in the former homeland, some of it along the street. I mean, if you fly to Umtata, you look at some of these things, but it's all over the country. You go to KZN, you go to the Enri on the south, 
you see those houses on top there overlooking the sea. So, so we, we have seen some people with money invading land, not only just state land. Some of these invasions, we see them on the land we have restored. Just today, I was dealing with an invasion of land we've acquired for land redistribution. The farmer failed to farm. The, he returned the farm to the department. Some people are now cutting up plots on this land. So we must now get an interdict, prevent those people from occupying that land. So we've got a very serious problem of land invasion. But come back to the communal areas. The problem there is that we need to find a way with traditional leaders to implement spluma on communal land. Whatever the issues are, whatever the differences are, because spluma is going to help uh, traditional councils, traditional communities, and local municipalities to do proper zoning of land. So that land that is zoned for agriculture cannot be used for human settlements or any other use. We are unable to implement spluma uh, in com on communal land because there is a, a stalemate between uh, the department on the one hand and uh, and traditional leaders on the other because they believe that they were not properly consulted when Splima was developed into law and they believe that they should play a much more bigger role in the in the in the decision making insofar as what kind of development direction the area under their jurisdiction in a particular local community, uh, 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 they, they want to have a bigger say on those processes. So, but we believe that Spluma could be a solution in terms of zoning, improving the relationships between uh, traditional councils and local councils will go a long way in terms of limiting uh, some of these challenges. We must acknowledge that. Uh, our single biggest problem at the present moment are the conflicts in the common property institutions, such as the CPAs and the trusts, largely those that have got tracks and tracks and tracks of land all over the country that has been returned through the restitution process. There's a lot of conflict there. People are taking to each other to court. Uh, others are under administration. There are allegations of corruption. Some of the land as much as we bought it for hundreds of millions of rand, some communities have decided to lease the same land back to the former owners, uh, but they don't share uh, the rental and whatever accrues from the use of that land by the former owners with the rest of that community, leading into all sorts of social conflicts. Chairperson, the, the, the comment that we should be coming back to this committee to report more regularly, at least on a quarterly basis, not only chairperson on the on the rollout plan and the progress we are making with regard to the allocation uh, of the 700,000 hectares. We want to come and report also in the implementation of the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. Because this will impact in your areas. You are on the ground. You have got constituency. We want to get feedback from yourself so that we can improve on these plans. Unless chairperson have omitted very specific question. What, what is clear to us, th there's a big distinction between agri-parks and the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. It, they, they are distinct. Obviously, the infrastructure we have built, that is the farmer production support units in different parts of the country. We, we can't ignore that infrastructure. We've got to enhance it. We can see how best it can be part, an integral part of the production schemes. But certainly, agriparks and the AMP are two separate. Uh, the, the, the AMP and its production schemes is a total system, fully operational. Production scheme are going to become the future pre- and post-settlement support for all our farmers across the board and uh, throughout the country. With regard to the land book, uh, to the land uh, land uh, audit booklet, uh, we must just verify that. But usually, we are talking about the land that is unaccounted for. It could be land that is unsurveyed and unregistered. 
but the number is quite frightening, 4 million hectares, I think we'll have to check it and we can respond. Um, the, the partnership with the land bank. The partnership, I think, yes, we know the land bank has been through a lot of problems. We are not banking on the land bank uh, financing the farmers. But, but there's a lot of leverage the bank has uh, on a, in a number of areas. For instance, this partnership with the uh, uh, Tiger Brands is facilitated by the land bank. If there's any money that is going to be involved in this process, it's going to be money coming from the private sector. It's going to be money coming from the department, not so much from the land bank. But we are working together with the land bank in developing new funding models for land redistribution, for farmer support, the interposition of inputs, mechanization, and the like. Chairperson, uh, I think I should stop here. We've tried to respond to those questions, unless there's a burning issue that I did not respond to. But I tried to summarize the 37 questions that you asked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DG. Uh, for responding to and check with you, whether do you have any follow-up question after the DG respond uh, to 38 uh, questions that we have asked? Members? I'm covered, sir. You are covered. You are covered. All of you are covered. Yeah, we are covered. I'm covered, Jefferson. Oh, okay. When you are covered, uh, it means Honorable Smith is covered. <laughs> Honorable Smith, are you covered so that yes, I'm, we I'm can covered. Lose? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Uh, before I conclude the meeting, let me give to the DM to say something before we close the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and I must also thank the members of uh, the committee uh, from your side and, and thank our DG, particularly on the way he responded uh, to the questions. Uh, in thanking you, Chairperson, for guiding us in this meeting, the road ahead is very long, and uh, if we work together, it is going to be reached the point where we can say, indeed, land redistribution is a reality and is happening in South Africa under difficult circumstances. And uh, I want to wish uh, your your members, uh, the time ahead. Land issues are very uh, dicey and very uh, dangerous at times. People have died because of land. So how we solve this problem, it is in the interest, not only of those who are in rural areas where a population of close to 60 million people and the stability on the question of land is very, very critical. And the support that um, we shall receive from the department, from, from the committee, is going to guide us to travel this difficult journey uh, this time around. So I thank you very much for having given us and myself in particular the opportunity to be uh, listening to the debates and the questions. Thank you very much, Chen. Thank you very much, uh, DG. I mean, oh, you, DM, DM, DM. Uh, for being with us the whole day and all the time you are with us, we thank you for taking us the, uh, 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 serious as the committee, not necessary uh, when the minister or some uh, dep another deputy is not there, they are not taking us serious. But when you you share this work together, we really appreciate it for that. Really, uh, even when we do an oversight, uh, we'll be having a courage that at least the, 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 the department, the head, the minister, the deputy minister are always 
be with the officials when they participate, I mean, they present to us. So thank you very much. Uh, when I conclude, uh, I just want to put the resolution, uh, DG and DM, that the department is commended for this achievement thus far, especially on supporting the farmers and distributing the land. We really appreciate uh, the department to do that. And then they must continue to do that to give land to people who can be productive and continue to contribute to the uh, actively economy of our country. Because agriculture is one of the pillars that can contribute to the, our economy. So we really appreciated that. And uh, DG, when you present there, you said you put your head on your block on the block to say you cannot give the beneficiary a land that is not uh, that is that that is not have the the right of water we really want to see that because if you give the beneficiary the land without uh, the water right it's going to be serious crisis like before uh, it was happening. And I just want to say, DM, please, as the minister and, you, and the D, both of you, to consider and take the necessary steps towards the key recommendation of the presidential advisory panel on the land reform and agriculture to accelerate and redistribute, expand agriculture product, production and transform industry in industry. Please take it uh, serious, that one. And the department is reminded that of the president state address, when the president, Honorable Matamela Ramapos, indicated that government will allocate land and for the settlement and the land redistribution claim and agriculture production, prioritizing training and allocating of land to you, women, people with disability, and those who have been farming on the communal land, they must be given a chance, and which the ones that they are ready, they must be given a chance to expand their operation. But the TG, he said, when he presented, he said they're gonna assist them. Thank you very much for that. We really thank you for the opportunity, GM, and the department. You are officially released, but uh, before you release the GM, especially DG, DG, I've asked a question or maybe it was a comment when I talk about the the land of uh, Bakar Bahama Sivi in Mushawan. Can you check for us what is happening? Because sometimes I'm afraid to go to my constituency because the traditional council uh, will be stopping me, asking me about this uh, land or what is happening because uh, people crept that land in the hands of the traditional leaders. We don't want that situation. So check for me what is happening about that land. And secondly, that I want uh, DM and uh, DG to check. Uh, in the village of Kabe, Kabe next in Mafike, there is a farm that was belonged to Mr. Flimi. That farm, it was given to back to uh, Mr. Flimi, but it's not the whole farm. It was divided and it's given the very same people who uh, grabbed that land uh, during that era, that apartheid era. It was, they, they were still there. They cut that farm into pieces so that they can accommodate those people. So please, can you check it for me again? 
what is happening, uh, DG, about that? Why they don't give the back uh, that farm, the whole farm to back to Mr. Fleming Kukabe at Kabe village? So with this uh, few words, I think uh, today we have fruitful meeting, Honorable DM and DG. So thank you very much. You are released to this meeting and then the members of the committee can they stay. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. We will, we will give a report on the issues of race. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Don't go around uh, the village, there is a COVID. Take care of, of yourselves. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Bye-bye. Ah, Smith, you must not go, you. <laughs> oh, because now you have asked a lot of questions, you are satisfied, now you want to go. You still have you still have an hour to stay. Are we leaving now? You are, no. not, you are, you are not the DG, uh, Smith. <laughs> How do you want to be a GM? <laughs> I know, you want to be a DG. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Honorable Smith. Smith want to be a DJ. I will appoint him. No, thank you, Chair. I, I, I think I, I enjoy the side of the table. <laughs> you want to be, <laughs> you want to be a DM of Mokala <laughs> I can be the mayor. We'll give him. A, he must be a Director General of Limpopo. Mokala we'll <laughs> No, we're not going to work on that way. Members, are we... Uh, Aska, hey, we are tired. Uh, hey, anyway, let me not say we are tired. Uh, chair. What is... Yes? We do not go, right, Chair. We do not go oh, in the do. forum. So, okay. the minutes, so the minutes will have to stand over until the next meeting. No problem. Uh, How many members are we now? We were... Uh, ah, but we are already... We it's Honorable six. Mudise, Honorable Matibe, Honorable Arnold. We only honorable have five provinces. Huh? We only honorable. have four. Chair, we only have four provinces present. We yeah, need five provinces. Oh. We are one province. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. No, no, no problem. We'll uh, adopt the minutes in the next uh, meeting. Thank you okay. very much, members. Okay. And okay. This issue of uh, mm -hmm. uh, land, re uh, land redistribution, we must uh, make from time to time make follow up on it. It's a very serious concern to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, ma'am, sir? Uh, oh, Honorable Smith? Yes, yes uh, Honorable Chair, uh, yeah. Um, did we get clarity on, on this matter of, the, of approving the minutes according to provinces? Because uh, if we remember, we were sitting about this issue before, uh, mm. whether it is provinces or whether it's individuals. Because when it's provinces, there needs to be a mandate from a province. And, and uh, that's, that, that was my, my question around it. So we need to get this thing around the quorum sorted out. Uh, please, Chair. Okay. Uh, no, because thank you I'm, very really, much. I'm concerned about that uh, because uh, you know, when it when it is a provincial vote, it comes to have a mandate from a province, okay. uh, and the province is not sitting in on the on the minutes of the of the meeting. Uh, we are sitting in as members of the committee. So um, yeah, if we can just sort that out. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, your point is noted, uh, Honourable uh, Smith. So anything uh, before I close the meeting, members, you are okay. Uh, so no exhausted. Work. Okay, thank you very much, uh, members, for attending this meeting. This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank bye you bye. Very